And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father." and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, thank you again for the morning. Thank you for our great Savior, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, it was a king who laid his life down. And I thank you for that. Father, the true definition of grace, when you are rich beyond imagination, you give it all up to be poor that sinners might become rich through you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the blood of the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Thank you, Father, for the King James Bible. Thank you, Father, for how good you have been to us. Just the fact that we are not burning in hell right now is more than I deserve, Father. I thank you for being long-suffering and patient even after saving me. I thank you for your promises that are yea and amen. And I pray, Father, today you would preach through me to these folks and that you'd speak to their hearts and their minds, that, Father, they'd be encouraged, exhorted, rebuked, whatever needs be for their particular life, for their situation, whatever they're going through, that, Father, at the end of it, you might get the honor and glory and praise due to your holy name. I thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. This period of time is known as Thyatira. It runs from approximately 500 to 1,000 A.D., it comes on the heels of Pergamos, which meant much marriage, where we saw the church and the world and the world and the church marrying themselves together and the church adopting things that it has no right adopting and, and acquiescing to. But now you're getting to a situation where if you thought the affliction was starting in 325 to 500 AD, it is full 1,000 degrees, man. I mentioned to you before, and it's not because I just have nothing else to say, I keep, I keep saying that, is that you should get a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. You should get yourself a copy of The Martyr's Mirror. You should do some research on what our brothers and sisters in Christ went through for their Savior so that you and I can meet in relative comfort today with a Bible in your lap. You ought to pick up maybe, I don't know what the live current day Website is, maybe some of you folks know, but there are martyrs today that are dying for Jesus Christ. 
There are people today being persecuted and afflicted because they love Jesus Christ in that Bible. We are so unbelievably fat, dumb, and happy in this day and age. It's not even funny. Not so with these folks. Thyatira means odor of affliction. They're being afflicted beyond belief. They're being chastised, scourged, in jail, and ultimately killed because of Jesus Christ and because of their stand for the Word of God. I would think if you get to a certain point in torture, it would just be better to die and be with Christ. It's far better to be with Christ. When you start pulling out fingernails and you know, chopping off knuckles and you know, lighting people on fire and then putting the fire out and then lighting them on fire again. And, I mean, honestly, just kill me, man. I had, was witnessing to a Muslim guy on the street one day, and I could tell he was getting a little fired up, and I was just being the usual kind, innocent person that I am and not egging him on at all about his nine-year-old pedophile prophet that he loves. And I th but there was a point to it that you ought to compare. If you think your prophet is in any way, shape, or form relative to my God, then go look in my book like I've looked in your book you will see a stark difference between Muhammad and Jesus Christ. Well, this person, he got a little fired up, and I said, man, you need to be saved. And I, I could tell he just wanted, he wanted to jump, man. And I said, listen, I can kind of tell you're getting riled up right now, and I'm not trying to get you riled up. I'm trying to get you to think about your soul and that who you're trusting on for the salvation of that soul. And I said, but if you're thinking about killing me right now, please make sure your sword is sharp. That's all they wanted. I talk like that to people. I'm trying to get them into, you know, shock them out of the internet. You know, get them out of their little world they're in to tell them about my Savior. And I will use any means necessary to shock them out of it. And he, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't want a dull sword, man. I don't, want, I don't want to be crippled in a wheelchair or nothing like that, man. I don't want to be Stephen Hawking blown in my toothbrush, man. I want to be dead and in glory with Jesus Christ right off the bat. These folks are not, they don't have that luxury, man. I mean, they're getting pulled apart, man. It's the, you know what the odor is? Those sweet-smelling savors in the Old Testament to the Lord. Does anybody know what those three sweet-smelling savor offerings were in Leviticus? The first one was what? A burn offering. The second one was what? A meat offering. And what was the next one? A peace offering. That, made, that was a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. And then the next two, the sin offering, the trespass offering, were not sweet-smelling savor because when God has to deal with sin, it's never sweet-smelling. But this odor rises up and the Lord of glory is just looking down at these people who are being tortured and put out and killed and pulled apart. I mean, you read, a, folks, that's in Hebrews 11, you know, sawn asunder. Can you imagine being cut in half? No, not, not like, you know, Doug Henning and the people in magician's school. I'm talking about really sawed in half. Imagine somebody sawing your leg off while you're still alive to get you to deny Jesus Christ. And the Lord looks down and goes... They're taking it from me. Right now, you just shut me off. Because you know where this is going. The affliction of our flesh, the affliction of our lives is what God takes great glory in. I'm not talking about reaping what you sowed. I'm talking about you just laying on the line for your Savior and you get afflicted for it. And you take it in a good way. And the Lord says, keep that coming. I love it. I love every bit of that. Because I saw my son one day suffer from, for your sins on the cross. Look what the Bible says to me over in uh, 1 Peter chapter number. Actually, let's do this. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. It was good to hear the Bible turn, pages turn this morning. I like that in Sunday school. Imagine getting up and talking about philosophy or some stupid thing. Let's have a nice day while your neighbor goes to hell and you enjoy your coffee. I like getting the Bible open, man. Isaiah 50, it's what will help you down the road. This book has a strange way of sticking in your ribs, boy, and bothering you, harassing you, and comforting you, and healing you. Look what the Bible says to me in Isaiah 53. Familiar passage, who hath relieved our report, verse 1, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor come in this and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and what? 
We looked at Jesus Christ and went, what are you doing with those nail holes in your hands? What are you doing taking that spear hole in your side? What are you doing with those thorns on your head? What are you doing with that spit in your eye and on your beard? What are you doing? What are you, stupid? No, I'm being afflicted because that's what my father wants. And the cup is not going to pass from me in Gethsemane. He didn't answer my prayer, but that's okay. I'm good with it. And I'll be afflicted and smitten for you. So if affliction fell on Jesus Christ, guess what? The folks in Thyatira expected it. And they got it. And you and I should expect it too. I mean, don't get upset when your boss says, stop reading your Bible on your break. Don't get upset when you have scripture verses somewhere and other people have nude photos of women on a calendar. You should stand up for your Savior. You should take it on the chin for your God. He took it on the chin for you. We draw him with a loincloth on there for just to be classy and to give some care. That man was naked and afflicted and bruised up there, hanging for everybody to see. The height of embarrassment and shame. And he said, you know what? I'll take it for you. Thyatira is like, we can take it for him. How about you this morning? Can you take anything for your Savior? Can you take a little bit of affliction? You think affliction is when the store doesn't have enough food in it. Or they run out of your favorite chocolate or whatever. Now, that is the tribulation period for me. And when Karen comes home, I'm like, man, that's stuff. And so I was reading Lamentations going, that's when Big Y doesn't have the car car oranges I like, man. <laughs> I'm like, I could write a whole book on that stuff. Or like last night when Taco Bell had those stale stinking things on the chalupa bacon. I just, come on, man, what's wrong with you? But I, we think that's what affliction is. No, affliction is like really to the point of death. That's the way this Bible is. Well, that doesn't happen now. Maybe it will. One of the things Brother Bird always prays, uh, 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 as he prays, is that if, it, if things ever change, Lord, would you give us the strength and stick to it in this and the character to stick to it? Yeah. Folks, do you understand people, most, for the most part, we hand out a track are pretty receptive? We just bring up the highlights of the knuckleheads, but overall, most people will take a track from you or they'll just say, no, thank you. Most of it. Yeah. Think about handing out a track in your downtown Iraq. Think about street preaching in downtown Iran this morning. Think about opening up this book and then having this on the front in front of a bunch of full-blown King James Bible-believing Muslims. Not the Muslims like Farrakhan. I'm talking about the guys with the authorized version Muslims, the ones that will kill you for saying what I just said about Muhammad. Well, would you be willing to take that for Jesus Christ? Would you, are, you, are you willing to stay? Folks, East, Ishtar is coming up. You're going to be willing to say something to your family? No, you know what? I love Jesus Christ, and I don't care about your stupid eggs and your egg hunt and your stupid little Easter bunny, and your stu unless they're chocolate, and I'll eat them afterwards. Preacher said I can do that. <laughs> Candy after Easter's the best, man. It's like they save it for you. It's like manna. Anyway, I mean, as you get into this thing, Easter's coming up. Any holiday, anything about, you know what? I'm not partaking of that because my Lord and Savior doesn't want me to partake of that. But see, you kind of compromise a little bit, and we all, listen, we've all done it. But then you sit back and wonder, I wonder how much Jesus Christ really compromised for me. Did he ever give up on the word of God for me? Would God ever do anything wrong to save a soul? He'd just as soon let you go burn forever, man, than break this book. When affliction comes, you'd be willing to take it. It's, it's a sweet smell in the nostrils of Almighty God. It's a good odor. Look what the Bible says to me over in 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll get down to the good stuff in about an hour, so don't worry about it. Here we go. First, I started late, and uh, Susan's watch is broken, so we can keep going, man. It's, it's stuck at 1230, which is good enough. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy and speak, more full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Go over me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1 says, Paul and Silvanus, that would be Silas and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of, faith, uh, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing Brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, 
having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They ought to see when things come your way, folks, and things come my way, that I can take it with joy because my Savior took it with joy because the Holy Ghost you heard in Sunday school is within you, and the, one of the first fruit of the Spirit of God is what? Love, joy. You can take affliction with joy, but the only way you're going to do it is through Jesus Christ with the right mind focus and the right heart towards your God. You can take affliction and make that odor be a sweet smell to your Savior and to your God if you take it with the right heart and the right attitude and know it's coming your way. You are going to lose family. You're going to lose friends. You should. And don't quote the verses, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Listen, stop it. I'm talking about when you stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and you do it the right way at the right time with the right attitude, guess what? People will peel away from you. Not because you're doing anything wrong. You just want to get close to your God, man. And people, save people, will. That's just too... Why do you have to go hear that preaching like that? Why does he have to talk like that every Sunday? Why does he believe that book's like that? Why, do you, why, why is that? Well, I just want to get close to my Savior. Yeah, but wouldn't it be better if we sang those songs and read from that Bible and got that attitude? No, it wouldn't be. No, it wouldn't be. You take the affliction with joy. You, you get the Word of God and the affliction and the joy in the Holy Ghost. What a great package. Oh, it's a great Sunday morning. I love it, man. Here we go. Let's go to Revelation chapter number one. I don't want, it's not, it's not about all being mean, man. We have a great time in the Word of God, but we've made Jesus so sugary, you get diabetes from most of the preachers. He's so sweet, which he is. And he's so kind, which he is. That you don't ever hear the other part where we, the Sunday school, he's going to come back and wreck everybody and the blood's going to flow for 200 miles. Yeah. You know what that's called? That's called a balance. Right. Are we supposed to have a balance? So for all the rapture and the blessedness and the, and the rewards and all that stuff and answer prayer and praise God and all that stuff, you got to know that, hey, you know, what, you, know, you know what comes with the Christian life? Affliction. You might have physical affliction that you didn't see coming down the road. You know how many saints are in the, in the hospitals right now, man? You know how many saints got stage 4 cancer right now? Saved, love Jesus Christ? What'd they do to deserve that? That's what you think. And that's what I think. Now, we know what Job's about. We understand that he had some self-righteousness issues. But you know Job's one of the three men that God said if there was these three men were in the, were in the, within a country, I'd save those three men. Nobody else, Noah, Daniel, and Job. You know how great a man Job was? So don't jump, jump right to what's wrong with Job. Do you realize how great of a man Job was that God would pick him out and let the devil have a run at him? You realize how great that man was? No Bible, no blood atonement, no, no infilling Holy Ghost, no promises of God, and he still loved God, did sacrifice for his kids, prayed for his kids in case they did it. You realize how great of a man was that, that, that Job was? What did he do to deserve 10 funerals in a day? What did he do? That's just God up there doing what God sees fit to bring honor and glory to him. Doesn't it make you cheerful to know you're saved on your way to heaven? It's the journey getting there that's kind of... Am I stepping on a razor blade or a claymore right now? <laughs> Affliction, man. Not fun. Let's look at the personification of Jesus Christ in this. I think it's pretty cool. It'll help you with where we're going with this or where the Lord's going with this more. Uh, first, uh, Revelation 1, verse number 12. I know we read it before, but that's okay. You're going to get used to it. Maybe you'll hide it in your heart. I hope you do. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like on the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, uh, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters." What is the personification of Jesus Christ in Thyatira? He's the Son of God. But what else is he? Eyes and what? Feet. Now, just stick with me. His feet are, are like what? Brass if they were where? <laughs> the trial of your faith being much more precious of gold that is in the fire. You know how you'll get through affliction in your life? 
Somebody already went through your hell for you. He already walked through the fires of hell. He already is acquainted with your grief. He's already well aware of your affliction. That's why he has feet like brass. Just like last week, it was the, it was the sword between it. That's why these personifications are specific to the churches. You know why it's the odor of affliction? You know why it's Thyatira and the tough things they're going through? You know why the Son of God is like this in this church? Because you're going to need someone who's been where you're headed. Look with me over in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3, Daniel 3 please. Daniel 3. Daniel 3. These personifications are not there by accident, folks. And I know you know that. I'm not being a jerk. But there's a reason why every one of those churches gets a different view of Jesus Christ. Because you have different spots in your life and different places in your life where you need to see Jesus Christ afresh and anew to fit your circumstance. He can be walking on the water for you. He can rise from the dead for you. He can heal the sick. He can do anything you need him to do. But he wants you to be conformed to be like him. Look what the Bible says to me, and I, you know that we're not going to read the whole thing about uh, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the real names for the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar does what? He, he gets a fire and says, he says, I'm, I'm heating this thing up five, uh, seven times hotter than any fire you've ever seen in your life, man. In fact, some of the men around that are Nebuchadnezzar's henchmen, they get pulled in the fire and get burned up and consumed. And you know what it all is? You turn and worship this image when you hear the dulcimer, and I'm going to say it because it's going to make everybody laugh, sack butt. I don't care how, my, how old I get. I'll be on my deathbed, and somebody says sack butt, I'm going to lose my mind. That's hilarious. Don't know what it is, don't care, but I hope I get to play it in glory. I, don't, I, want, to be the, I want to be the first orchestra of the sack butts. I don't care. <laughs> and just have a whole row of sack butts, man. I don't, it just sounds cool, man. <laughs> sack butt. Hey, why are you acting like a sack butt today? What's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> It just go, hey, you, don't, you say, don't you say to people, stop acting like a Nimrod? Why would you pick Nimrod? The first king of Babel? Type of the Antichrist? See, I'm scripture one of you sack butts, so no, you mark it down. I got a verse for anything, man. Don't <laughs> put a mic in the back going, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. All right, the Bible says this. Look at verse number 24 with me. Daniel 3, 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was a stonied, great word. And rose up in haste. We saw a few of those folks in uh, East Hartford yesterday. They were a stonied. And rose up, <laughs> rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Then they give you the goosebumps, man. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who's in the fire with those boys? The Son of God. Now you say you're being stupid right now. No. What was Jesus Christ's title in Revelation 1 when he had the feet of brass and the eyes of fire? Son of man. What is he in Thyatira? The Son of God. I'm right there to go through the fire with you no matter what, is, no matter what your affliction level is. I already have my feet have been through the fire. What are you going through, man? Pain? Kidney stones? Loss of a loved one? Family member down and out? I don't, I don't know. What, what, is, what is the thing you're being afflicted by today? Number one, I'm being afflicted the right way for the right thing at the right time because I'm serving my Savior. I've examined my heart the best I can through that book, and guess what? I, the Holy Spirit has confirmed it. I'm doing it the right way, and I'm taking this on the chin for the right reason. Lord, would you help me go through this? I know you've already been through it. I know the Son of God went through the fire with those three Hebrew children. And I know he'll go through the fire with me. Did he not already go to hell for you folks in Psalm 16 and Acts 2? He went to hell. He walks across the water and says, I got an appointment to keep with that thief. Jesus Christ has already taken the worst thing that could possibly happen to you and already said, you know what? Let's walk together through this thing. Brass is a picture of the judgment of God. He's taking it for you, man. He's taking it for you. That's why you can get through this time. And it's, it's, it is, it's not, this is not fun. I don't, I, honestly, folks, we talk about the sodomites rising up and all this crazy stuff going on with our government and all this stuff. I don't, maybe there's something that you don't, you don't even care what, maybe you don't even care what's going on in the government and don't care about the sodomites and all this stuff. Maybe you're just being afflicted personally and you're going through some stuff that only you and the Lord know about. He's there to assist you and help you. You know why? Because he wants that odor 
to come up. Boy, that's a sweet smell. He's handling it right. They handled it right. They're going through it, but I've already been through it. I can get them through it. They'll be all right. Go with me over to Acts 16. Acts 16, please. Oh, well, this has gone in a different, different direction, but that's okay. I thought my notes were inspired, but I guess they're not. Acts 16. <laughs> I really don't preach off my notes. You know that, man. <laughs> Just write down some things, man. If you, all kidding aside, that's, this is the church in Thyatira. There's about 65 verses on this, at, at least. We ain't hitting that now. I can't tell right now. I just ain't going that way. I want to show you something. Acts 16. You're like, thank God he answers prayer. Amen. <laughs> Woo! We've been praying for that, man, for a long time. Now, if we can just get him to listen to that a few other times, we'll be all right. 16, I just want to show you something neat. Now, we saw in Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, which means fully purposed, we saw they left their first love. We saw what was going on there, okay? And we saw how some things went awry, and he told them to repent and get that, get that thing right. And I made some comments that Ephesus and, and all the seven churches, you don't really find them in a King James Bible. You find a couple of them. Well, Ephesus, we know I have an epistle to the Ephesians, right? And that was a real place. Paul ministered there. Diane Graves, Diane of the Ephesians, and Jupiter, and all that, all that stuff going on there. Thyatira, maybe you've not thought about this, but Thyatira is in your King James Bible. Look what the Bible says to me in Acts chapter 16, verse number 14. Acts 16, 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if he had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto this way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her. Go to Revelation 2. Please, right where we were with Thyatira. Verse number 19 says, I know thy works in charity and service and faith, and thy patience, they're a working church. In fact, they double work the works at the last are more than the first, and thy works in the last to be more than the first. Look at verse 20. Not with saying, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophet, to teach and seduce my spirits. Uh, yeah, seduce my spirits, that'd be good. To teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things, sacrifice, and idols. Let, let me ask you a question. What showed up in Thyatira? A woman possessed with a spirit of divination. What is divining? Telling the future. What does Jezebel call herself? A prophetess, which is what? Telling the future. One woman, Lydia, gets saved. Then her household gets saved. And right when things are getting busy for the Lord, guess who shows up? The serpent. And how does the serpent show up? In a female who says she can tell the future. Now, you probably think this is, well, you're, now you're going to go female bashing. Not even for a second. Not even for... There's a lot of snickering in the crowd. That's not good, man. Not for a second. But the female, by God's design, is the weaker vessel. She is typically more spiritual than we are as knuckleheads. She's open to seduction and words and, and flatteries that men, I didn't say men don't like being flattered. I'm just saying that men typically don't fall for that because we just plow right through stuff. Men, uh, women are more prone to words and, you know, following what their heart says. That can leave you open, ladies, for a bunch of stuff that you have no idea. Well, come down your road. Now, I'm not saying, I didn't say it about anybody in this congregation. You took that wrong, take it up with the Lord. But I'm telling you right now, you are more susceptible to deception than a man is. A man will just grab the fruit and say, just give me that fruit and I'll just die. Yeah. That's because we're real smart like that. Oh, I banged my thumb with a hammer. Let me do it again for emphasis. 
And you know what? Now that I've only got four fingers, now I've only got four fingers this side, I'm going to hit this one over here, so I'm really done, man. That's the way we are. We're just, just bullheaded and stubborn and ignorance and strength. But women are more like, talk to me, would you? Ah, uh, yeah, man. It's weird. But that's what is going on in the church. Ladies, be a lady. We saw it last Sunday school. That's a good thing. And God has gifted you if you're saved just like he has a man, except for a couple offices. But you've got to watch out for that woman, Jezebel, in that church who runs her yap and says, I have great things in store for you because the Lord told me. Now, when you spend 30 years in jail ministry and you come on Thursday nights after they just had rec reunion, residents encountering Christ, I spelt it W-R-E-C-K. Because after we got them four days later, after it was usually they were wrecked. I, Dave, a woman came and laid hands on me. I'm like, really? Did you punch her? <laughs> Now, she told me that I had a great life in front of me, and I was going to be a minister ministering to thousands. Now, maybe that's the case. If God, the Holy Spirit, through that Bible in your prayer time tells you that, but you don't need no stinking Jezebel coming along. You don't need no woman with the spirit of divination. Oh, and BTW, LOL, FYI, because I love all those wonderful things on the text. I'm looking right at you, man. And the other one, the other one over here, the two-headed, the two-headed text monster that lives in my, <laughs> lives in my phone, man. Just for you to consider, did that lady in Acts 16 with the spirit of divination, did she say anything biblically incorrect? <gasps> well, she must be filled with the Holy Spirit because it's it, it's biblically accurate, is it not? Oh, man. You better try the spirits, 1 John 4, 1 through 4. The one that usually comes to you the most seductively and, you know, like that serpent slithering through the garden and standing upright and talking, which is kind of a weird thing. The, the devil transforms into angel of light. He will seduce you with religion, and he'll even get with that book and seduce you. And that spirit comes into a church man, and I've just been around this for a long time. I'm not jaded. I'm not light green and work over in China. I'm not jaded. I'm not, if you're smart, you got that, man. I'm not jaded, but I'm just saying, you see that spirit in our churches today where the females are the preachers, the females are the pastors. And uh, ladies, honestly, I'm not being mean. Females run in the house on TV shows, talk shows, and preaching women. The one woman I wrote in my Bible next to over here, uh, Jennifer, please don't hit Jonathan while we're preaching right now. But I mean, the, the, one, the, one, the one that's coming to mind right now is Juanita Bynum. Yeah. You know, I got the long white robe, and she's up there screaming and hacking and, you know, everything. she's a prophetess, and she can see the future. And they, Woman, shut up and sit down and get a Holy Ghost-filled man up there with a Bible. Yeah. You're out of order, sister. But you see that now because men have done what? Yes, dear, whatever you want. This is not masochism. Get, get over it, man. You're better off with a father in the family than no father in the family. You're better with a husband-run house the right way. Don't pay, well, they beat, no, we're not talking about, we're talking about a husband-run house the right way. If you had one that's not that way, I'm so, that's, it's horrible. I'm talking about God's order. Don't let sin Enter in and say, well, well, that's... Just, no, 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 no. God's order is man, woman, children, if God allows, with him at the head. The head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. Christ submits himself. <clears throat> My kids don't run the house. That's going to shock you. They never ran the house. Now, uh, okay, now you're ready to say, Karen doesn't run the house. <laughs> I'm not laughing because I'm just, she, but I, I, I can be a little bit ogreish at times. It's going to shock you. <laughs> so, what's the balance of being a strong male leader and not being a jerk? I haven't mastered it yet. I'm, because if you say something, you come across as a jerk. You raise your voice, you're a jerk. Or you're stern, you're a jerk. You preach like that, you're a jerk. No, man, just trying to get some masculinity back in our churches and our families, at our job. 
You know, it's not about diversion, whatever it is, include what, what DEI or whatever stupidity is going on now. No, I have a role to play. You have a role to play. But I'm saved. I'm, in, I'm a child of God, man. I'm going to go by what the book says. And this Jezebel spirit, what does she do? She seduces and she teaches. Did you not remember our series on last times, last, sign, uh, last uh, days for the child of God? What are they going to do? The Spirit speaketh expressly, then the latter time, some shall do what? Give me heed to and seducing spirits, Jezebel, doctrines, teachings of devils. Je you know where Jezebel comes from? Her, her old man's name in the Old Testament is F. Baal. What? Where do you think they went to church on Sunday? Let's get, let's get, let's get in the, the Fred Flintstone cruiser and let's go worship at the groves, man. Her old man's name is F. Baal. The prophets of Baal and the prophets that sit around the table we saw it Wednesday night, they love Jezebel. She loves false doctrine. You know who F. Baal and that whole group of the Zidonians, which actually comes back from Dan? Dan is a serpent and a lion. This is not a good lineage for this woman. She also has Jezebel in her name. Bell? That's not good, man. You know who her old man was in that whole area of worship? Now, stick with me. Ashtoreth. You know who Ashtoreth is in the New Testament? Diana of the Ephesians. You know who it is in the Catholic Church? Mary. Who is not the Mary of the Bible. It's always a woman who is exalted because Jesus and God need help. They need a co-mediatrix. And that spirit of seduction, that ability to teach, and well, what's wrong with the lady being up there? And what's wrong with the woman? God said it's improper and out of order. Now, ma'am, if your husband has died or if you are divorced, that's a different scenario. I, I'm fully aware of that. And I understand there are, there are things that play out that this fits the normal situation. But I know we don't deal with normality. I understand that. But you can, through the Word of God and the power of the Spirit of God, you can deal with those situations. I'm talking about God's order of things is Him, His Son, the man, the female. And then if you have kids, they're not even mentioned in 1 Corinthians. It's, it's the father, the son, the male, the female. But not Jezebel, not in Jezebel's world. Don't, don't you remember old Ahab one day? Ahab goes by Naboth and says, Man, you have such a nice vineyard there. I'd like to grow some herbs in it. He's the first CBD uh, store in the Old Testament. He wants to grow some herbs in there. And he, and he, go, and he, and he goes home because Naboth says, No, this is, I'm, playing, I'm growing stuff for the Lord. This is, my, this is my patch land. And what does Ahab do? He goes, <laughs> oh, I'm not. And, and the woman. Oh, I'll don't, don't worry. I'll make sure there's enough cupcakes for St. Valentine's Day. I'll make, I'll make, you knew it was coming. You just knew it was coming, man. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure there's, there's enough flour and eggs. Kenny, Kenny, you better make sure you roll that dough out the right way, man. Preheat that oven or, oven or I'll smash you. But, I mean, you get into this whole, you get into this whole thing. But the, 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 that's the pastorette, man, right there, man. That's how you get, it, that's how you get into this whole thing, man. And... <laughs> He cries to his wife, and his wife says, don't worry. And do you know what she does? She goes behind the scenes and gets people to bring a false report against Naboth. And they all rise up and kill Naboth. Jezebel is not a good woman. You know how she ends her life? Exactly what God says, you're going to be licked and eaten at dogs. Hey, uh, Ethiopian eunuchs, what you doing up there? Oh, nothing, man. We just chill. Well, you see that chick over there with the got the harlot hair going on? It says she tired her hair. She painted her face. Does that remind you of anybody in Proverbs five, six, seven, eight, nine? The harlot. And she walks away. You know uh, what, what, what you doing? And doctor, as Doctor Ruggman would say, chunk that old lady down. You know what they do? They throw her down, and she ends up, and the dogs eat her. That's the end of that woman. She had all that power, didn't she? She's queen, Ahab's woman also. But that spirit and that fornication, those things, sacrifice, she's bringing that all in. You say, well, what is that? What is it? You've got to be aware of what's coming, going on and aware of your circumstances around you and what the flavor and the spirit of the age is, folks. 
That is not an indictment against any female at all. I have two female corgis, I have two daughters, and I have a wife. So I'm females, it's God's big joke. Do you know the brown, the brown men, the athletes, the big stud athletes? You know how many boys there are in our family that we gave from us? Zero. Mark's uh, daughter, Kathleen, had a, a son. What's that? He brought the curse. He brought, he brought, God's up there going, oh, think you guys are cool, huh? No men for you. Because <laughs> you know, you know, if we had, we have had a boy, oh, it'd be terrible, man. It'd be terrible. He'd be a left-hander, and he'd be throwing BBs, two seamers, all, and he'd be drafted. And we make money off him and make churches, of course. You got to, you got to throw that in there. <laughs> I'm serious. All, all, all the, all the big male, you know, the Browns and all that stuff. No. Men, it's just you get together and all the nieces. It's eight, eight or nine of them just just going at it like it's hilarious. And you just sit back and go, God just laughing at us right now. <laughs> look at all the look at all those females now. So hey, this is not an indictment against females at all, not for a second, not for a minute. But you've got to be careful about this Jezebel getting into the church, and that Je- that Jezebel spirit can get on any one of us, man. Sacrifice to idols, and I mean, you got a whole chapter. First Corinthians ten is about that. The cup of the Lord, cup of the devils. If you go in there, and if you can sit down there, and just don't commit sacrilege. If you don't offer to an idol, sit back. But if you can sit down and eat with a good conscience, so the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, and all those things that are quoted in First Corinthians 10, number ten, you can sit down and do it as long as it's not offered to a devil and all that. You can sit down and eat with them, have a good witness, a good testimony in front of them. But once that thing is offered to idols, and the guy said, "Yeah, we just pulled this out of." Uh, <laughs> Necron over here. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we ain't eating it, man. We ain't eating it. But that stuff goes into the worldly attitude you can also have and how Jezebel infiltrates your, just your daily life. You say, that's crazy. No, Re- go read about Jezebel in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Read about her legacy. It, it's horrible, man. But that's what he has against that church. But did you read further down about Thyatira? He goes, but to the rest, I say, who have not fallen that way. Remember that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4 we just quoted? And some shall give heed. We don't have to be the some that gives into the foolishness that's going on in our churches. And, our, and I don't care what they say about our hymn book. And I don't care what they say about the King James Bible. And I don't care what they say about my pet lion behind me. I could care less what you think. I don't care if you associate me with Dr. Rockman and Peacock and Knox. I could care less. I love them people. They've taught me. I don't care. You think I care? Well, I'm not being peer pressured by you. I'm not going to stop standing on a street corner because you came up to me and wanted to fight me on Friday night. That was good too, man. Yeah, he spit coming out like David at the door, scrapping his beer. Oh, yeah, all freaked out. What'd you say? Then he took about three steps and I went, I said you need to be saved the Bible way. Then he backed down. There's two chicks over there like this. (laughs) <laughs> laughing, you know. I said, you ought not to laugh. You need to be saved, too. Well, we weren't really talking about it. I said, well, now you're in the conversation. Because <laughs> they think it's kind of a joke. No, what, what you think because he, that's the way you feel. You're just scared of come up to me and say it. That's what you really feel. So while you're over there enjoying a puff and getting a little nicotine fix, okay, I'm down with it. I'm going to tell you Jesus Christ came to save you, too, man. And you ought not to laugh at it. But the spirit is, is that, well, why do you do that stuff? And you got those hymnals, and why don't we get the bouncing ball? And why, don't we get, why don't you change the book? And why don't you get a little sheet up here? Why don't you hand out sheets and fill them in? No. How's that sound? No. No, not happening. Because you start constricting the spirit of God, man. No, let him have his way through the book, man. You just be the yielded vessel when you're up here, man whether it's the lady singing a song or whatever the case might be. This spirit of Jezebel is something else. And we're, like I said, you see all the verses here. We're not, we're not going to do this. Go with me to Revelation. We'll get a couple more thoughts, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up in the morning. Look what the Bible says in verse number, uh, oh, verse 21, if you could, please. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 21. 221 says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Now, that, that bothered me. And it still does bother me a little bit. What's the space? Isn't that weird? Now, I, I don't, I'm just saying I don't 100% know, but go with me to verse 14 of the same chapter. The Bible says this about Pergamos. 
But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a summon out before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed on idols and to do what? Doesn't that sound like exactly what she's doing? So what's the space to repent between Pergamos and Thyatira? And they didn't repent. Isn't that weird over in chapter 2 with Pergamos? It's the doctrine of Balaam, the male, and she brings in Ashtoreth. There's a lot of good stuff going on in these chapters, man, to watch out for. And, and uh, what I'm saying is that one of the lessons this morning that I took from this personally and for you is that when God calls you to repentance, as a saved person, you're not getting saved again, but you're getting some things right in your life that are out of whack and out of line with your Savior. And don't tell me through the conviction of the Holy Ghost and the preaching of the Word of God and your own, even your own private time that God has not said stuff to you and said, let's deal with that right now. Yep. You want that. You don't want that to become this dim voice. You want it to go, five alarm. Something's wrong, man. You should appreciate that from the Lord, that He doesn't just stop with you at salvation, that He wants to continue to conform to the image of His Son and that when... The call to repentance comes. You're not asking the Lord to wash you in his blood and you're saying, Lord, you know what? I got a wrong attitude today about people. I got a wrong attitude today about driving in my car. I got a wrong attitude towards my wife or my husband. And you know what? You, I can tell you're dealing with me right now to turn from that. And I'm going to turn from it. Jezebel didn't turn. Did she? Now, stick with me for a second. Jezebel's husband is who? It's Ahab. Did Ahab repent at any point in his life? He did. She didn't. As you say, what's the, what's the, what are you trying to make here? Listen, when God calls you to get some things right in your life, to examine some things in light of that book, don't turn it off, don't shut it off, don't get hard to it. Examine yourselves because you know what? You'd rather be Ahab who's living wickedly and done those wicked things, listening to his wife and doing what he did, except he repented when it finally got down to it. She said, I don't care what that preacher says. I'm just putting in my time. I don't care what he has to say. I'm going to do things my way. That, that, see, that's the spirit of Jezebel that can get onto a man. She wouldn't repent. Ahab did. As what, I mean, you think about it. Did Nebuchadnezzar end up repenting? Now I know there's a God in heaven. Did Manasseh's, the wickedest, longest rule, 55 years of any king, a horrible king, did he repent? Ahab, Manasseh, and Nebuchadnezzar repented. She didn't. So when God talks to you, what do you do? Shut it off? Do you think, oh, that's just a preacher. That's just what he thinks. That's just what he feels. That's just, he's just, he's just emotional today. I'm psychotic every day. This is not an on-off switch. I wonder what he's like. You know it, man. It's not like, oh, well, I wonder what, wait. No, it's, it's full out A++++ personality. But you got to always check it with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And when He comes to you and knocks on the door of your heart, don't say, I'm not repentant. I'm not turning. I don't, I don't need to change. That's Jezebel. That's Jezzy paying you a little visit. Don't harden your heart to that, man. Don't harden your heart to it. All right. Verse 25. Please. Verse 25, the Bible says this, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. 1 Peter chapter 5, please. 1 Peter chapter 5, a couple verses and then we will we'll shut her now. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. The odor of affliction, Jezebel running wild seducing, teaching, all kinds of stuff. But not everybody, had, not everybody fell into it. Not everybody went that way. A lot of good stuff in Thyatira, man. The Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he devour, whom resist, 
steadfast in the faith. Isn't that one of the attributes of Thyatira? Charity, service, faith. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, faith and afflictions, and we're studying Thyatira, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, please. Psalm 119. Brother Bert took a hurtful shot at me <laughs> regarding Psalm 119. <laughs> Psalm 119. Verse number 67, please. The Hebrew letter Teth. Bible says this in verse number 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Affliction is a good thing applied the right way by Almighty God. Did you notice what number letter that is in the Hebrew alphabet? Teth. It's the ninth letter. Nine is the number of what? You know how that fruit really becomes evident in your life when you yield this flesh and every day you die daily, that sacrifice, that odor of affliction. And God can use that thing that he purchased with his own blood for his own divine purposes and not yours. And affliction's part of it. But thanks be unto God, it's just for a little time, man, compared to eternity. Brother Guido, pray for us this morning if you could. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the word of God that you love us to an absolute standard and uh, through affliction and growth. Let you with us in that affliction. Amen. That we don't do things that would be unsafe to work with us. That we don't have an angst for the future. That we know who holds the future in his hands. That you'll never leave us and desert us. Strengthen us as we go out the door today. We're going out into the mission field. Amen. Let's be good testimonies for you, Lord. Give us all traveling mercies to and from here today. Ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.